it's sunny, so so it's not too bad. But still, yeah. we have to get used to that. I mean, winter is winter all the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, now now you are an Austrian citizen, more or less. Uh, so yes, so I used to complain. To add, no, no, no. Yeah. In fact, sunny. <laughs> so <laughs> yes. I do like all the Austrians. Uh, I just uh, work in Vienna, and then every weekend I go to Italy for shopping or to the seaside, like all of them do. <laughs> How long does it take? It's less than four hours with car, or maybe three hours altogether with the plane, uh, or five and a half hours with the train. So it's. Uh... So you you have to take the Brenner Tunnel. No, no, no. I, it's uh, I go to Tervisio, so it's totally east. So yeah. it's uh, it's not too bad. It's uh, uh, train would be the best, but the the railroad uh, is still dating back to hundred years ago to the. So, <laughs> I see. So it's so it's, uh, it's a Quite UNESCO a heritage. It's a UNESCO heritage because it goes up all the mountains, so it's very nice. But well, once you have well, done it's good that for three tourists, times, but not for exactly. businessmen. Exactly. Once you have done that three times, <laughs> you want to go faster. <laughs> so, Kelly, did you get into the YouTube channel? Yes, I managed. Okay, because I, I texted Bala, so good. now we don't need him anymore, huh? <laughs> someone, yeah, someone with ninety-seven had approved and verified it. I don't know who that person is, but like, okay, so. Okay, very good. So, Tilly, where are you located? Uh, I'm living in France, Lille. Okay. But at the moment, yeah, right now I'm in Bordeaux. I see. So we are not that far. Where are you? <laughs> in Toulouse. Ah, in Toulouse, yes. <laughs> at home in Toulouse. <laughs> I, pre I prefer to stay at home today for, for the webinar because... If I am in my office uh, at IMFT, I, I take the risk of something, somebody knowing at the door or the phone ringing, well, et cetera, et cetera. To be, to so be it's honest, better to stay at yeah. home. To be, to be honest, you and I should have been on a strike like everyone else. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah, but, well, you, you are preventing me from, uh, from uh, <clears throat> going, going on strike. I think and, that would have made a real good, yeah, good impression. Joining the, yeah, and joining the, the exhibition, yeah? Good morning. What Hi, is, Bala. Hi, Bala. Hi, Bala. What is the strike for? Still for the... Pensions. pensions. Yeah, six, from 62 to 60. The pensions, actually. Yeah, the increase in the age of pension. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's a, it's a strange story in a way because there was a, a previous project that aborted three, four years ago now, just before COVID. And that first project seemed to be, let's say, <clears throat> a, a little bit better as some, well, it took into account, let's say, more variability between the career of uh, various people, et cetera, et cetera. But the second project seems to be entirely focused uh, on the idea of, uh, let's say, making the system financially stable, <clears throat> yeah. reasonable. And uh, but well, many many people many people realize that with this system. Uh, they will lose something. Well, I'm not, by the way, I'm not concerned because I'm too old, uh, but, uh, well, for, for many people, it's a serious concern, yeah. Yeah. How are you doing, Bala? Very good, very good. Uh, um, so you, you're sitting on the beach, Bala, as usual. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> hey, uh, Jack, uh, today I have... Uh, um, something right after your seminar. So usually I stay and uh, participate in Q&A, uh, but today I may have to run away very quickly. Okay, okay, okay. I will for forgive you. I should. <laughs> Hi, Jack. Very nice to see you. Yeah. Uh, Alfredo, you're gonna do the introduction, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Very good. And I think that uh, Jacques, you will speak for about 45 minutes. Uh, then yeah, there will well, be questions and answers. Yeah, yeah, we will go yeah, as, as long as we can. Yeah, well, I will, I will see. Uh, I didn't check exactly 
how long it takes but well i can skip so far some of the material if uh, well maybe maybe if, you want me five minutes uh before the four i mean it's not strictly 45 so no no but yeah. um you have it <laughs> <laughs> just Very in case good. just in case yeah yeah Okay, so sure, it's <clears throat> it's quite late for you. Hmm? Yeah, it's uh, it was still okay. It's nine forty-five. Yeah, Sometimes yeah. Sometimes okay, this yeah. semi the seminar starts from uh, from the eleven p.m. for me. Yeah, yeah, okay. So today it's still okay. So how are you doing <laughs> these days? Are you coming to Kobe? No, no, I don't. Oh no, I don't. Oh. I decided to save the planet. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, too 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 we much traveling. You. So I okay. decided to skip this one. Ah, okay. But th there will be many people from IMFT. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure uh, Eric will come. Oh, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Well. So. Well, basically, uh, IMFT will be half devoid in, during uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. during that, that week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and pr planning to give the proposal proposal for the ICMF next time, right? To yeah, use. for sure. Well, yes, uh, uh, Dominic. Uh, Eric, Eric is handling it. So, but uh, do we you will think see. You... We will see if the competition is very tough or not. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to do in two years from now or in three years? Because uh, no, I think uh, it's in. Well, I'm not quite sure, but I think it's because in we lost years. one year. Because we that's lost right, one year right. during COVID, so we could have. I mean, there there are two options yeah, available. Yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, as as with every conference, actually, in uh, yeah. well, in some cases, for instance, ICTAM, ICTAM decided to have it uh, in 2024, yeah. although the previous one finally take place in 2021. Yeah. But they, they decided to, to keep to the maintain. usual Indeed. scheduling. Yeah, but yeah, I think so yes, for ICMF, yes, I think they are targeting 2026, yeah. Okay. I don't know, I think it's, it's again a matter to be discussed uh, in the committee, right? It's not sure. Mm -hmm. Right, Shu? Yeah, right. I, I'm not committee member now, so I don't know the what's going there. Yeah. Uh, right, will be the chair, and the, the, Dominic, Dominic Rujando will be in the committee. No, no, no. Eric Eric will do it. Okay. Eric Klima. No, no, no. Not me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the, there is a government, governing board, right? Yeah, uh, yes. And the, the governing Dominic board. is on the governing yeah, board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 How many registrants do we have, uh, Telly? 64. 64. Okay. Well, 30 French are on strike, of course. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, of course, well, for for uh, for people in uh, in US, well, especially on the West Coast, is not so pleasant. But uh, what yes. to do? But uh, historically, very few were attending from West Coast anyway, and most of the people were from China, Japan, and uh, Asia Pacific. So we learned over the years that it's better to keep the time uh, uh, friendly. I mean. To the extent possible, but still, it's quite late. <laughs> well, well, it means it means that you have to do something. That is, you have to go to California and tell them uh, well that they have to attend. Otherwise, well, uh, they will miss rocket science. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, yeah, we try to involve some uh, because the demographic is such that there are 10 times more people doing uh, multi-phase flow now in China. Uh, and sure, sure, sure. So what can you do? I mean, you can't change those numbers easily. 
And also here, they, they are also sort of in a stage where they are hungry for, but you know, most of the Europe and here, people are already saturated with seminars, etc. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's so true. This, this seminar series, uh, uh, in some ways, benefit uh, um, countries that are up and coming uh, far more than uh, uh, maybe Europe and uh, uh, America. But it did serve a purpose uh, when COVID was rampant. Yeah, yeah, of course. Maybe of course. we keep asking whether to continue or not. Uh, in fact, uh, Alfredo was not uh, initially very favorable. He thought that maybe we could stop, but then we decided that we'll run one for one more year. <laughs> well, of course, you, <clears throat> you certainly have statistics of the attendance. Uh, <clears throat> well, and so you can see how how it evolves, of course. Yeah. At some point, if you decide that, um, well, the attendance is not large enough, then it will stop, I guess. Well, I think that uh, it, it was, it serves a purpose and it was useful before and it is still useful. But at some point, uh, I think that we should, uh, yeah, of course, uh, so, some activities will still be done uh, uh, online, we learned that uh, many things, many meetings can be done online, uh, more administrative meeting than uh, uh, scientific meetings. For the scientific meetings, I think it's always nice to have it in presence. But this last year, I think we can uh, we can just uh, we can just do it. So to leave at least a three years yeah, yeah. of activity, oh. right, Vala? Yeah. Well, for instance, JFM is still having the webinars. Well, every every month, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Exactly. Well, I don't know if the attendance is uh, increasing or decreasing. I shall go to see you. Isaac, good to see you. <laughs> Hi, Shu. Hi, Hi yeah. Let me just leave for a minute, please. <laughs> Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Very good. Good. <laughs> good to see you. Are you ready to come to Kobe? Yes, sure. Now, yeah. I'm applying for the visa. <laughs> okay. Great. I, I don't even know. Do we need, do I need a visa to come to Japan? I'm not sure. No, 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 not for no. you. I think. No, oh, no, okay. no. I don't see but so. from China, you need a visa. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. That's uh, complicated. Yes. Yeah. So people are still taking masks, taking in Japan. In ma in Japan. Yes, as people are taking masks for the. But uh, on, a, on, a volunt on a voluntary basis or. The outside it is allowed it to take off, but still people are well should take So it. you must wear a mask. No, 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 no. It's not the uh, outside not of the good. inside. Inside it's a kind of the still, but outside uh, now it's okay. But the still people are used to wear right. so they So we bring our mask because here <laughs> nobody is wearing masks. Oh, day. okay, okay. Yeah. Well, Eric yeah. is coming. Well, here somebody in Europe, somebody oh. still wearing mask uh, on a voluntary base. For instance, especially if, if you go on the train or if you go at the airport, you you will find people with. Uh, yeah, masks. here in the airplane, maybe about uh, 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 half a dozen wear mask, even in airplanes. Uh, uh. Good morning, Greta. Hey. Hello, good morning. <laughs> Hello, Greta. Is that Hi, Greta. sunlight? Hi, Eric. The one I see on your back from the window, or, or is is already sunny in uh, in your place? Of course, it's always sunny in Baltimore. But this is my office window, and yes, the sun has been up for a little while. Yeah, there is okay. sun on the, on the walls. I see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So the the train on the train, people. I, I think more than ninety percent of the people are still wearing the masks. Uh, that's a lot. Yes. Yeah, nearly close to the one hundred percent. But outside, it is allowed it to 
take off. I see. I see. But the policies keep changing. I mean, uh, yeah, we'll yeah, find yeah. out uh, what's the policy uh, first week of uh, April. <laughs> yeah. I think I'll come to Kobe by train. I'm landing in Tokyo. I think I'll take the okay. shit and send to, to come to Kobe. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would be yeah, very nice easier. to see. And you, yeah. you see the Mount Fuji. Yeah. So take the seat. Take the seat right side of the the train. Then you will see the Mount Fuji next to you. I will do that. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, Mount Fuji looks nicer from a distance. You know, I actually climbed Mount Fuji many times. Exactly. Years ago. <laughs> yes, so. It's better to see a from that, <laughs> right. that, that crime. So, uh, greater that would be a one-day trip, or uh, you need multiple days. Uh, it's pretty much a one-day trip. Uh, my son was with me, and we climbed sort of halfway up uh, late that night, and then in the timing it so that we arrived at the top in the morning. I see. I see. And uh, then, you know, we saw, saw sunrise. It was actually not as impressive as I had thought it would be, but uh, <laughs> and then when we came down sort of the same day, so. It was cloudy, yeah. no. Mountain tops <laughs> are better from far away. Yes, it is. <laughs> So, Jack, did you um, turn on your uh, slides and share your screen? Did you try yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I tried. did that already. You did that. Okay, good. Um, so, actually, we are already live. Telly uh, uh, has already uh, put us on YouTube. Uh, um, and you will start recording, right, Telly, uh, in a few minutes? Still have four minutes, so in a couple of yes. minutes we. Yeah. We already started re recording, right? It, uh... Not really. Uh, Not really. Uh, we are live on YouTube. Oh, be but... careful with oh, okay. uh, with what you say, Shu. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If the mic is open, you know, <laughs> it can lead to some disasters. We have plenty <laughs> of history on this. <laughs> So is this the exactly we started two years ago, right, Bala? Oh, almost, yes, yes. almost exactly two years ago. So yeah. this is the beginning so of the be, third year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this will be two and a half years. This will be start of the uh, sort of a third year in a way. Yeah, okay. yeah. So Jack will be giving the inaugural for this yeah. season. Uh, actually, Rama spoke a couple of weeks ago, no? No, she will speak. Oh, I thought she no. already had spoken. No, you are the number one, uh, Jack. Mm -hmm. uh, there is nobody before you. <laughs> no, but uh, I, was, I, I felt very honored that Rama spoke <laughs> first. <laughs> hmm. So Jacques, I will briefly waste one minute of your 45 minutes. Uh, uh, so I will try to condense all the things you've done in, and I will just give a brief uh, recap of your activity and then floor will be yours. Yes, pl please be brief. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm going to admit everyone in. If you want to remove your cameras, then that's the time.
Okay, Tilly, can I share the screen? Yes, sure. Okay. Okay, do you allow me to share? Yes, you can share, please. I can share. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, fine. Okay, so I think we can start. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. These seminars are always attended by people all over the world. So we have different, lots of uh, different time zones. My name is Alfredo Soldati and I have the pleasure to introduce Jacques Magnodet, the inaugural speaker of these uh, semester seminars. And we were just doing the, the math and this is the third year we are running this seminar series. So we are very happy to host you here in, in, in such a large number for this uh, inaugural lecture of this seminar series. Uh, just uh, two words, uh, I will be uh, forcefully very short uh, about our distinguished speaker, Jacques. He kept busy himself uh, all the times for during all his research with multiphase flows. He's a senior researcher at CNRS. He was already previous director of the MFT in Toulouse. And uh, he works on a number of aspects of hydrodynamics uh, and turbulence, but mostly uh, with different phases uh, and uh, with the non-homogeneous fluids. Uh, he uh, is using a mix of theory and numerical simulations to come to uh, in good insights and uh, deep insights in the physics of multi-phase flows. Uh, and today he will uh, uh, speak about particles and bubbles which go through interfaces uh, and stratified layer. Just one thing uh, to mention, he's currently the Secretary General of uh, uh, the European Mechanics Society and uh, he's also editor of Journal of Field Mechanics. Uh, please, Jack, floor is yours. We look forward to your talk. Well, thank you very much, Alfredo. So good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everybody. So depending on where you are staying. So it's a great pleasure for me to deliver this webinar today. And I have to thank um, Bala and Alfredo for inviting me here. So today I've decided to speak about, uh, let's say, <coughs> sorry, effects of stratification on all sorts of particles because I think this is an important topic and perhaps it's not so well known in, in the two-phase flow community. So, uh, uh, okay, so yes, the perfect place actually to, to appreciate these effects, I think is the upper ocean because there are all sorts of particles living in the upper ocean, let's say, and uh, well, for instance, we are all concerned uh, nowadays with plastic pollution. And the most recent estimates are that about uh, 15 million tons of plastic are released every year in the oceans. And these debris actually cover a wide range of scale from more than 10 centimeters to down to uh, the micrometer. And since they have uh, density, which is almost that of water, actually, they are very sensitive to stratification effects. Another unpleasant example, as you certainly remember, is uh, what happened when the deep water horizon oil rig uh, had a major leak uh, 13 years ago, and more than half a billion liters of crude oil were released in the Gulf of Mexico during a five uh, months uh, amount of time. And well, this uh, many droplets had to rise over more than 1200 meter across the water column until reaching the sea level. And of course, during uh, this more than a kilometer uh, high water column, they experience a lot of stratification effects uh, as you will see. A more pleasant example is actually uh, provided by marine snow, 
Marine snow is actually uh, made of uh, very porous aggregates uh, with a wide range of, of size from, uh, let's say, tens of uh, micrometers to several centimeters. And this uh, marine snow is made of organic matter, mostly phytoplankton, and it plays a crucial role in the biological pump that exchange, let's say, organic matter between the near surface region of the ocean and the deeper ocean. But there are many other examples. And for instance, near the seafloor also, the organic material is degenerating. And for this reason, myriads of uh, methane bubbles are uh, generated. They form plumes. And of course, these plumes rise until the surface. And again, they cross uh, several successive stratified layers. So, well, the sketch of uh, the general situation may be summarized uh, <clears throat> as uh, here. So you see some sort of particles here dispersed in the water column. And during some time, uh, while settling or rising, they will experience some density stratification here. And then if there is unfortunately, for instance, a noise leak at the surface, they will at some point cross the interface between the oil leak and the fresh water. And at this point, actually, they will experience a jump in the physical properties because there is a jump in the viscosity and in the density of the two media. And there is also interfacial tension taking place. So these are basically the situations I have in mind today. So, uh, <clears throat> well, let's say to formalize things a little bit, uh, all what I'm going to talk about may be summarized in a way uh, within the vorticity equation obeyed by uh, the disturbance generated by the motion of the particle. Here, the black terms, you recognize the familiar vorticity balance, but actually in, in a general situation, there are three more terms on the right-hand side. So the red one, uh, you are pro probably quite familiar with it. It's a so-called baroclinic torque. And this baroclinic torque is non-zero as soon as the density uh, gradient and the pressure gradient are not collinear. So this is the main term uh, to understand what happens uh, across continuous or abrupt density gradients. But there are two extra terms in green here. So one is related to the gradients of the viscosity and how they combine with possible strain region. And the last one is related to the gradients in the curvature of the interface or directly to the gradients of surface tension, and in which case this produces a Marangoni effect. So in the first part of this talk, I will focus on the red term, whereas in the last part, I will focus on, on the green ones. And also what you have to bear in mind that the reason why stratification effects may be tremendously important is that the deeply influence, for instance, the retention time or even the dispersion of particles, drops, and bubbles in stratified layers. And also, they govern to a large extent the decay or the growth of bacterial matter and small living organisms in the upper ocean. So here are two examples. So this is, again, marine snow. So marine snow, as I told you, is a very porous uh, uh, kind of aggregates. The porosity is often beyond 99%. And for this reason, a marine snow sinks at a very uh, low settling speed. And because of this, actually, uh, it is, of course, very sensitive to stratification effects. And this can uh, induce very long retention times across layers in which stratification in la is large. So for instance, here, what you see in green is a concentration of marine snow across 
the first 100 meters below sea level. And on the right, you see in red, actually, a record of uh, the, the brunt Vaisala frequency, which is a measure of stratification. I will define the brunt Vaisala frequency in a minute. And you see that there is clearly a one-to-one -one correspondence between the peak of stratification and the maximum of the concentration in marine snow. So clearly, marine snow can be stuck into uh, layers where stratifications, stratification effects are large for a very long time. Here is another kind of particle, so to say, which this time is a large Reynolds number particle. So this is what is called uh, an Argo float. Argo floats are Lagrangian observational floats. There are more than 3,000 all over the oceans nowadays. And these floats are used to monitor uh, various uh, quantities such as temperature and salinity. And the nice thing with these floats is that by pushing a piston in and out, you can actually adjust their net weight. And by this, you can decide at which depth in the ocean the float, the float will stabilize. And the interesting thing is uh, the plot, which is here, which shows how the settling or rise velocity of the float varies uh, with its net weight. And you see that there are two regions in this plot. Actually, there are the two arms here and there in which the rise or settling speed varies as a square root of the net weight. So this is nothing but a usual inertial regime. But when the net weight is very small here, as you see in the insert, actually the settling or rise speed is varying linearly with the net weight. And this is where stratification effects actually control the dynamics of the float. So this is, uh, a typical example of a high Reynolds number particle, if you wish, which is sensitive to stratification effects. So let's start with uh, what happens in the case of a continuous density stratification. So the canonical situation is that of a sphere, for instance, settling with a constant uh, speed W uh, within a layer in which stratification is linear. And in such a situation, it's known that stratification has two main effects. First, it enhances the drag, and there have been several asymptotic predictions of this enhancement in the, in the literature. And second, it may also dramatically modify the usual wake structure. And I will show you some examples of this in a moment. So the intuitive idea to understand the influence of stratification of such, on such particles is to say that the body motion in some sort distorts the isodensity surfaces, which are called the isopignals. And because of this, actually, the body drags a certain amount of light or heavy fluid with it. And this dragged volume of fluid actually results in a net buoyancy force, which can be positively or negatively buoyant. But in all cases, this force cooperates with the drag resulting from the settling or rise of the body. Of course, well, <clears throat> the next question is how can we define quantitatively the relevant drag volume? And so to formalize this a little bit more, let's uh, consider the governing equations of the problem. So we consider a sphere with radius r, which settles with a velocity w in a linearly stratified fluid. And so the density as a position of the particle is just the sum of the background uniform density plus a linearly varying density due to the background density gradient. And this term, of course, depends on the current position of the particle plus some disturbance. And of course, the motion of the particle also induces some disturbance velocity, which I note you prime. So once you normalize all things uh, properly, uh, you end up with the following set of governing equations. 
So here you recognize the governing equation for uh, the density disturbance of the stratifying adjunct. There is, of course, a diffusion term in this equation, which is inversely proportional to the Peclé number. But there is also a source term, which results from the background density gradient and the settling velocity of the particle. And then in the Navier-Stokes equation, of course, there is also another source term, which is just due to the variation of the buoyancy force. So we adopt, of course, here the Boussinesque approximation. And so the problem depends on three dimensionless numbers, the Reynolds number, based on the settling speed, the Peclé number, which involves, of course, uh, the molecular diffusivity, and the Froude number, which is a ratio of the settling speed dividing by the characteristic uh, speed of stratification, in which N again denotes the, <clears throat> the brunt weissala uh, frequency. And of course, there are also uh, conditions to be imposed at the sphere surface. And for instance, if we assume that the sphere is non-porous, then we have to say that there is a no penetration condition for the stratifying agent at the sphere surface. So regarding the brunt weissala frequency, here are some orders of magnitude. So typically in the upper ocean, uh, the brunt weissala frequency is about is about 0.01 Hertz, but it may be one order of magnitude larger in some specific regions, such as thermoclines or pignoclines, but also in estuaries and fjords, uh, where it is about 0.1 Hertz. Now, if we are considering sharp interfaces between emissible fluids, of course, there is no natural length scale left, and uh, the only left scale, left length scale at our disposal is the radius of the particle. And in this case, you can define uh, a brunt weissala frequency in this way. And for instance, for a typical crude oil, actually, with a drop which is one millimeter in radius, you find that the brunt weissala frequency is about 50 hertz, which is very large. So with this, you can form the frown number in this way, and you can interpret the frown number as a ratio of the char characteristic time of density disturbances one over n divided by the time it takes to the particle to travel over a distance equal to its size, that is r over w. And so uh, in the ocean with n, uh, within uh, the range 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus one hertz, only very weakly buoyant particles, and for instance, marine snow, are affected by stratification effects. And for instance, bubbles are not because they rise too fast. But in contrast, at sharp interfaces, bubbles and drops are deeply affected by stratification effects, as you will see. So here are two examples uh, showing you what happens regarding, well, uh, the settling speed or the rise, the rise speed and the drag coefficient for a settling particle here and a rising bubble here. So here, this particle is settling in a two-layer fluid. There is light fluid at the top and the heavy fluid there. And so you see how its settling speed decreases uh, <clears throat> as, the, as the particle settles. And you note that there is a minimum in the settling velocity at this point, which of course uh, translates into a, a huge peak in the drag coefficient. And now moving to the case of a bubble rising across an interface. So the bubble is, go, is coming from the heavy fluid, then it, its velocity decreases at the interface. It goes through a minimum like the solid particle here, and then it recovers a new uh, rise speed in the, in the upper fluid. Okay, so this is exactly the same phenomenology in both cases. And in both cases, it's the density difference that creates this minimum here. So <coughs> to get a little bit more into details, 
Uh, I will now comment on some results that uh, we obtained a few years ago with my colleagues Jay Zhang and Mathieu Mercier by performing DNS uh, around a settling sphere up to Reynolds number of a few hundreds and Pecklin num and Prandtl number, sorry, of 700, which corresponds to salt in water. And by the way, actually, you may notice that this implies Pecklin numbers of more than 10 to the, to, 10 to the fifth, which is uh, quite demanding from a numerical point of view. So, here, what you see on these plots actually is, uh, <coughs> well, in color, you see actually the isosurfaces of the vertical velocity around the particle. And this vertical velocity is measured not in the sphere reference frame, but rather in the laboratory frame. And this is important, and you will see in a minute why. Then on the left side of each frame, you see these black lines, which represent the isopignals, whereas on the right side, you see the streamlines, again, in the laboratory reference frame. So, well, here we are, we are considering low Reynolds number, 0.05, and from left to right, we go from uh, five numbers of five on the left to 0.5 on the right, and we consider two different values of the parental number. One which is about unity, so typical of a gas, whereas the second one is 700, which is typical of salt in water. So what you see is that when the parental number is about unity, then the Pecklin number and the Reynolds number are both small in this situation. And so the flow structure here or there preserve a four half symmetry typical of the low Reynolds number regime, whatever the Frown number. Now, if we move to Prandtl number of 700, then the Pecklin number is already quite large. So you see that the isopignals are no longer symmetric, which means that some light fluid is dragged by the sphere. You see here the, the deflection of the isopignals. And then two a different situations may occur. If the frown number is still large, then, well, this distortion of the isopignals doesn't influence the velocity field at all. That is, you see that the velocity field here preserves the four aft symmetry it has there. But now, if we move to a low frown number, then the flow structure changes tremendously. <clears throat> Here you see two things. First, you see that there are now closed eddies. So keep in mind that the system is axisymmetric. So this means that uh, here we are looking at toroidal eddies. So there are toroidal eddies forming along <clears throat> around the body. And you see here the red color. And the red color, if you look at the color bar, means that the velocity in the wake here is positive. And keeping in mind that we are looking at velocities in the laboratory reference frame, means that actually, although the particle is settling, the velocity in its wake is going up, which looks quite strange. And things are even stranger if we move to larger Reynolds numbers. So here we are considering a Reynolds number of 100, because now you see several features. For instance, you, know, you notice that there is no standing eddy past the particle. So your favorite standing eddy, which you expect to find at such a Reynolds number, doesn't exist anymore when the Frau number is of the order of some units. Okay? It has been completely, uh, <clears throat> completely uh, removed by stratification efforts. Then the closed flow region, that is the toroidal eddies we already saw before, are still there. And uh, while well, the stronger the effects of stratification, the smaller the vertical size of uh, these toroidal eddies. Then also looking at the wake now, uh, <clears throat> well, you see that moving to uh, small frown numbers, the wake is becoming thinner and thinner. Here in this situation, it's extremely thin. And according to the color scale here, you see that the maximum velocities in the jet 
are now four times larger than the filtering speed and they are directed upwards. So really, we have a very thin and very strong upward jet in such a strongly stratified situation. So this is very unusual compared with non-stratified uh, wakes past, uh, past a particle at this Reynolds number, okay? And so regarding the drag, what happens now? Uh, well, we can, of course, define the drag uh, in the presence of uh, stratify, uh, stratification effects. So now the drag coefficients depend on the Reynolds number, the Prandtl number, and the Frau number. And of course, we can also refer to the drag the particle uh, would expect to experience in a homogeneous fluid. And that would be uh, the drag defined in that way with a drag coefficient CDH. And of course, the difference between the two drags tell us uh, what uh, stratification effects uh, <clears throat> generate in terms of, uh, of drag modification. So here, here are some results. So the top row corresponds to Prandtl number of seven, which is typical of heat diffusing in water, whereas the bottom row corresponds to salt in water. So uh, focus on the orange line in each panel. So what you see is that, uh, well, on the left, which corresponds to low Reynolds number, basically as the Frau number decreases, well, the drag increases and may be larger by a factor of two uh, compared to the homogeneous drag if the frown number is small enough. Now, if you increase the Prandtl number to 700, then you see that the drag may be increased by a factor of four instead of a factor of two at a Prandtl number of seven. And now if you move to high Reynolds numbers, the drag increase becomes much higher and you see that in these two situations here, so whatever basically is the Prandtl number, actually the, the drag is increased by more than an order of magnitude when the Frau number becomes very small. So clearly there can be a tremendous influence of stratification effects on the drag if uh, the Frau number is small enough and if the Prandtl number, so the Peclet number is large. So these variations actually of the drug and so these stratification effects on the drug may be actually rationalized, uh, well, by considering actually a splitting of uh, the governing equations. So I don't want to bother you too much with these technical details, but uh, I just want to give you, a, well, an idea of what we did. Basically what we did is that we split uh, the velocity and the pressure fields into one component, which is uh, due to the translation of the particle in the fluid. So you recognize the usual uh, Navier-Stokes equation, plus another component, which is due to stratification. So this is an exact decomposition of the full governing equations. Of course, there is uh, a direct interaction between the velocity and pressure field uh, corresponding to this part and the stratification induced uh, contribution. But with this decomposition, actually, uh, what you can do is that you can examine, well, the leading order contribution in each uh, equation. And with this, you can determine the scaling law of the stratification length scale, LS, which is a scale over which buoyancy effects induces a velocity disturbance, which is of this, the same order as the velocity disturbance uh, resulting from the settling of the particle. And with this, actually, you can compare this stratification induced length scale with the length scale uh, corresponding to viscous diffusion and that uh, corresponding to the diffusion of the stratifying agent. And of course, you can get a plethora of regimes with this because uh, the stratification length scale can either be smaller than the other two length scales. <clears throat> this is the case here, 
or it can be larger than these two, and this is the case here, or it can stand in between. And depending on, uh, well, this uh, hierarchy, let's say, you get actually uh, a, a plethora of regimes and a plethora of scaling laws for the stratification induced correction to the drug. So for instance, is a regime here, you see that this correction depends on the Fraun number, the Reynolds number, and the Prandtl number, whereas in the last regime on the right, it only depends on uh, the Fraun number and the Reynolds number. So you get the scaling laws, and the nice thing is that after that, actually, you can come back to your computer in which you can measure uh, well, the prefactor in each regime, and with this prefactor, actually, you get an estimate of the stratification induced modification to the drug, which allows you to make predictions even beyond uh, the range you explore in the DNS. And with this, for instance, actually, we were able to predict the drug on the Argo floss at a Reynolds number up to 5,000 within 2%. So we were very happy with that. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about uh, particles uh, that experience a density stratification, a, <clears throat> a uniform density stratification. And I would like uh, now to move to bubbles and drops when they cross a sharp interface. So now the situation we are facing is, uh, is this one. So there is, unfortunately, I know it's leak at the top of uh, the upper ocean. So we have uh, a certain viscosity and a certain density within the oil leak, which differ from those of the fresh water below it. There are two different interfacial tensions between the drop or bubble and uh, well, the, the surrounding medium here and there. And there is also an interfacial tension between the oil leak and the fresh water as the interface here. So because of this, actually, there is a density contrast, which translated into a fraud number. There is also viscosity contrast, lambda, and there are three successive burn numbers, which are relevant depending on the position of the drop or bubble within the water column. Okay, so here are two examples with, uh, of what happens with spheroidal bubbles when they cross an interface. So basically the two uh, videos you're going to see uh, correspond to the same conditions, that is the same density contrast, almost same Reynolds number of the bubble in the lower fluid, and same three bond numbers. The only difference between the left and right video is the viscosity contrast between the two fluids. Here, the two fluids have almost the same density, whereas on the right, the, the upper fluid is 50 times less viscous than the, low, the lower fluid. So let's see what happens now. So you see this guy crossing the interface, embarking some of the lower fluid and towing a slender column with it. There is a small tip forming at the back of the bubble, but nothing very, let's say, spectacular. So we can play it again. Okay, you see there is some distortion at the bottom and some tip forming at the bottom of, of the bubble, but this actually disappears after a while. And we see just, well, the slender column <clears throat> behind it. Now let's move to the, to the right video. You see what happens actually. Well, <clears throat> there is an enormous distortion of the bubble as it crosses the interface. Then there are strong shape oscillations. The bubble takes a Mexican hat shape and we see small, well, even tiny bubbles released 
well, in the in the column behind behind the bubble. So you see, by comparing the by by comparing the two videos, you see that the viscosity contrast play a key role. Uh, well, in this situation, and it makes the fate of the two bubbles very different. So let me just put my pointer again. Okay, so here is the record of the rise speed in the case of the first bubble I showed previously. So again, you see uh, the velocity uh, in the lower fluid, then the decrease until uh, this velocity reaches a minimum across the interface, and then the velocity re-increases in the upper fluid. And by the way, on the right, you see the evolution of the of the volume of untrained fluid behind the bubble. So you see that starting from zero, it reaches a maximum, which is in this case about three times the bubble volume before uh, decreasing and returning to zero. But now, if we consider what happens for the second bubble, the one which was on the right video, you see that, well, of course, the, the rise speed was almost constant before the bubble reached the interface, then there was this small uh, minimum at the interface, which again correspond to small effects of the density contrast. And then there, there is, of course, a very sharp increase in the rise speed until the bubble uh, recovers a new rise speed in the upper fluid. But you may notice that actually the ratio of the two extreme rise speeds, <clears throat> the one here compared to the one there, is only by a factor of three, whereas uh, the viscosity has been divided by a factor of 50. So clearly, uh, if the drag coefficient were proportional to the inverse of the Reynolds number, then uh, we would expect the velocity to uh, increase also by a factor of a 50 or so, actually a rather a factor of 40 because there is some density contrast. And the fact that the velocity actually increases only by a factor of three is just because there is an extremely uh, large, let's say readaptation of uh, the velocity shape uh, the, sorry, the bubble shape as it crosses the interface and its cross-sectional areas increases tremendously and so does its drag coefficient. And thanks to this increased drag coefficient, actually the readjustment of the bubble shape mitigates very strongly the jump in the rise speed. So this is something which is of course specific to drops and bubbles and doesn't apply to uh, rigid particles, but you see that in this case, it's very efficient to limit actually the jump in the rise speed of the bubble. So here is another example with larger bubbles. So these bubbles are spherical cap bubbles actually. And again, I, well, they correspond to uh, let's say not uh, exactly similar but close conditions so the bond numbers are pretty the bond numbers are pretty close the reynolds number is larger on the left than on the right but this this doesn't make a very large difference and again the largest difference comes from the viscosity contrast which is about unity on the left whereas it's about 0.02 on the right so again I have to, okay, so le let's see what happens on the left. So you see the bubble towing a very large colon of the lower fluid now and taking this mushroom-like and towing a long slender colon of fluid for Y. Now on the right, you see more or less the same. Well, the deformation at the back of the bubble is larger, but again, it tows a long and slender column of fluid. So we can play the two again. So it seems that in both cases, 
well, there is not much variation of the rise speed of the, of the two bubbles. By the way, I can play the one on the left again, because at some point you may notice that there is some, let's say here, you see that there is some disturbance, some lateral disturbance in the bubble shape. And this is actually the point at which the film ahead of the bubble breaks. So yes, as I said, well, there doesn't seem to be a huge variation in the rise speed of the two bubbles. And indeed, if we go to the next slide here, we see that in the first case, actually the rise speed remains almost constant throughout the rise of the bubble. And you see that uh, the volume uh, of uh, the lower fluid entrained by the bubble now reaches large value. It can be up to seven times the bubble volume before starting to decrease. Now, on the second bubble, the one on the right video in which the viscosity contrast is 0.02, again, there is no jump in the, the right speed. There is only a mild increase of the rise speed across the interface. And so this is very different from what we observed with the spheroidal bubble, of course, and to understand why such a gentle variation is made possible with spherical cat bubbles, we have to keep in mind that actually the rise speed of spherical cat bubbles is proportional to the square root of, uh, of their radius of curvature at the apex. This is a famous Davis and Taylor formula. And because of this, of course, since we don't expect the radius of curvature at the apex to experience a jump at the interface, there is no reason for the right speed to experience a jump. But there are more subtle uh, things taking place there because if you look at the evolution of the radius of curvature along the rise of this bubble, actually, you may notice that this radius of curvature increases uh, <clears throat> little by little as the bubble rises. And well, this increase in the radius of curvature ca can be understood easily because, well, you can, of course, equate the drag force acting on the bubble to uh, its net, the net buoyancy force acting on it. And if you do that in both fluids and take the ratio of the two, actually, you end up with a conclusion that the, the ratio of the two drag coefficients in the upper fluid and in the lower fluid times the ratio of um, the two ready of curvature to the cube should be of order unity. And since the Reynolds number in the upper fluid is much larger than that in the lower fluid, of course, this drag coefficient is expected to be much smaller than that one. And for this reason, actually, this radius of curvature must be larger than that one. And this is why we, we see this increase here as the bubble rises from the lower fluid to the upper one. Okay, so I think I'm coming to an end on this talk. And so I would like to summarize uh, the main findings I reported. So for instance, uh, regarding first, uh, what happened to uh, bodies rising or settling across a continuous density stratification, uh, what I tried to show is that when the fraud number reaches values of order one, uh, there are distinctive features occurring. There is a distortion of the isopignals, which results in a, in a drag colon of heavy or light fluid that goes with a particle. There is also a true vertical stack of toroidal eddies around the body. There is a, down, a, downward, a downstream jet dominating the near body flow structure at moderate to large Reynolds number. And you saw that the velocity, that is the upward velocity in that jet may reach, may reach values which are significantly larger than the settling speed, which is very unexpected. And uh, of course, 
you also uh, saw that the stratification induced drag increases tremendously with the Reynolds number and may exceed by far uh, the drag which is due to the to the translation of the particle when the Peclé number is large. Then at sharp interfaces, what I showed is that the viscosity contrast is the main player, at least for uh, bubbles and drops, because this viscosity contrast changes the shape of spheroidal bubbles and drops. And thanks to this adjustment in shape, actually, uh, there is a strong mitigation of the variations of the rise or set settling speed compared to those of uh, rigid particles. In contrast, for spherical cap bubbles, actually, this viscosity contrast only secondarily modifies the rise speed because the rise speed in that case depends on the radius of curvature of the bubble and not directly on the viscosity of the surrounding fluid. And all these, actually, all these features, actually, the important thing to keep in mind, and maybe this is a main take home message I would like to deliver, is that you cannot understand all these features just by considering the drag volume of fluid embarked with the particle. You have to consider how vorticity is generated by the extra terms I showed you in uh, the general vorticity balance in the presence of density gradients, viscosity gradients, or surface tension. These terms play a key role. And this is by considering these terms that we can rationalize what we see in the experiments or uh, in the simulations. And with this, I think I am done. And I thank you for your attention and I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you very much, Jacques. Really many thanks. And by the way, by the way, I don't have to forget to express my warmest thanks to uh, my collaborators and especially my two colleagues who may be around today, I don't know, uh, Mathieu Mercier and Jay Zhang, with whom part of uh, this work was carried out. Thank you again. So I'm pretty sure there are a number of questions. I, I, I just give the floor to Bala because I think he has to leave soon. Thank, yeah. thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Jack. Uh, fascinating uh, talk as uh, um, one would expect from you. Um, I have one question. Um, most of the conditions uh, you had uh, the density variation in the vertical direction, and therefore you had a buoyancy force. Um, mm -hmm. If you consider, say, for example, compressible flows, uh, shocks, etc., where your density gradients or variation could be not aligned in the vertical direction, it could be in any direction. So there seems to be this uh, buoyancy induced uh, sort of effect of uh, isopycnal lines bunching up, but there may be some other intrinsic effect that is not connected with gravity. Uh, is there a way to separate these two mechanisms? Because that may be very useful uh, uh, for application in uh, compressible flows where gradients could be in some other direction. Well, well, of course, you are perfectly right. And actually, of course, there is not only this uh, baroclinic torque playing a role uh, within a shock, uh, but there is also this guy here, because in a shock, you also have a, a jump, uh, a, a viscosity jump, and, and you can have strain taking place with, within the shock. So this term actually is also important in a shock. And by the way, actually the original derivation of this term, at least the one I was able to find, uh, is taken from a short note that came out in the, in the AIAA journal in the, in the late 80s. So that was directly related to the presence of this term in a shock. So yes, there are uh, definitely 
buoyancy effects, well, not buoyancy, but let's say density gradient effects, but also viscosity gradient effects in shocks. And uh, well, you can, well, disentangle them by considering at least these two players here and uh, see how the corresponding terms uh, in, the, in the governing equation uh, modify well, the drag or the other loads acting on the particle. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question myself. And uh, uh, you, Jacques, you've shown us that uh, you have a readjustment of the bubble shape that is mainly responsible for the reduction of the vertical velocity of the bubble. Mm -hmm. And uh, this does this correspond to a minimization of energy criterion? First part of the question. Second part is, uh, uh, are the internal flows inside the bubble important for this thing? So the viscosity of the fluid inside the bubble? Well, the vis no. Uh, well, th the second part of the question is easy because, 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 let's see what we have here. Well, <clears throat> well, you see this plot here. Actually, the blue uh, the blue squares correspond to experimental data, whereas the red line corresponds to a volume of fluid computation. And in this volume of fluid computation, actually viscosity within uh, the gas phase is negligibly small. So uh, given the very good agreement between the two evolutions, it's easy to conclude that the viscosity of uh, the air or the gas within the bubble doesn't play any role. As for the first part of the question, uh, unfortunately, I don't think I have the right, uh, the right picture here, but actually we also uh, carried out some computation with a code based on the Canelier formulation of the equations. And in that case, actually, uh, well, it was not possible to predict correctly uh, the readjustment of the shape. Although, uh, as you know well, uh, the Canelier formulation implies uh, that uh, energy will be minimized in some way when the three phases are together. So this means that something else uh, is taking place and you cannot just predict uh, this readjustment of shape just by minimizing energy. Of course, energy has to be minimized, but it doesn't provide uh, the complete answer. Thanks, Jack. Questions? Ray, please. A very nice talk. And I, I have uh, maybe two questions. Um, so the first question here is um, uh, related to the uh, one of the slides you mentioned about the land scales and use that to predict the different scaling laws. And uh, amazingly, it can also uh, show some pretty good agreement with the Argo float uh, drag. Um, that, Maybe that's, we were uh, very lucky. No, no, no but, but I, I'm just curious. This is the uh, this is a very interesting result. So the 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 land scale argument does that assume sort of an isotropy, like to some degree, but the moderate to high Reynolds number, you show the very uh, interesting jet phenomena. Uh -huh. I wonder um, uh, why this argument works actually uh, extrapolating to five to the 10 to the power of three uh, Reynolds number. <coughs> well, actually, actually, well, you, you know, well, <clears throat> okay. So we, we are now talking about the high Reynolds number regime. And actually, in that regime, so already, let's say, uh, under such conditions here, well, we are in the regime which is uh, which corresponds basically to um, a drag difference, which is going like the inverse of the fraud number alone. So in that regime, it means that neither the parental number nor the Reynolds number are playing a role. And well, the, the drag difference is just governed by the frown number. So if we are able to get the prefactor 
uh, of the corresponding uh, scaling law uh, <clears throat> in, for instance, in this computation, then it's easy to extrapolate it to higher Reynolds number because, um, well, basically the regime remains the same and the physics remains the same. So, well, if you want, in a way, the jet here, well, it's nice, but it's so thin that it doesn't make a significant difference in the drag. The drag is essentially governed by, by what happened on the rest of the sphere surface. And the jet is so thin that it doesn't modify the drag. So as long as you know how uh, to describe, well, the variation of uh, the velocity and stress along the particle surface in that regime, then you are armed to predict what happens at a higher Reynolds number. And this is why actually this scaling law works also for the ergo float. Uh, that that uh, does that also mean that the, you can extrapolate to even higher Reynolds number? Uh... Well, uh, well, we have to be cautious, of course, because well, these are uh, axisymmetric computations, and of course, at some point, the flow is no longer axisymmetric, and actually there is a flapping instability of the jet, but this instability uh, is somewhat specific in that it takes place not at the surface of the sphere, but actually at the top of the jet here. So there is a flapping instability there, but it doesn't seem to have a significant influence on the drag. So we are still exploring this aspect, so I have no uh, definite conclusion at the moment, but I doubt this will change the drag by a significant amount. Okay, thank you. So the second part of the question related to the particle-particle interaction, uh, because this is a very different from uh, um, in the unstratified environment. I wonder if you put two particles close to each other, how does the stratification affect their um, hydrodynamic interaction? Well, it, it does affect them a lot. Actually, <clears throat> there have been some recent work on this by Bruce Sutherland and the group of Eckhart Maibor, uh, some numerical work on this. And actually, uh, well, although I don't think they reach uh, such low frau numbers, actually, they showed that basically, uh, well, if I, if I am not mistaken, actually, stratification effects when when basically when the particle are settling side by side, actually stratification effects tend to um, make them uh, getting closer to each other, uh, whereas when they are uh, settling one after the other, so in line basically, uh, well, stratification effects tend to make them repel from each other. So there is. An effect, and this has to be quantified, of course. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ray. Questions? No, everybody. I don't see. Are there compelling Everybody questions? Is tired. <laughs> some, some are having a nap, etc., etc. <laughs> no. And uh, but, uh, some are on strikes also. Yes. <laughs> so I thank you very much, Jacques. Thank you again a lot for the very nice talk. And uh, thank uh, I thank the audience for for being here and raising interesting questions. Uh, and remind you all that in two weeks from now, there will be the seminar of uh, Rama Govindarajan. So thanks a lot for being with us and uh, suggest our YouTube channel to your colleagues. <laughs>